Hello, I'm Mr. Tie-Dye. So I've been doing videos for about two years now and have I think just over 200 videos on my channel. Uh, so if you're new to the channel you can explore all of those. For anybody else that's been around my channel for a while you know that there's a lot of information that's kind of scattered around in all of the videos. But I've had lots of requests for doing a video that has all of the tips and stuff all in one place. So we're going to take a little journey with this t-shirt and follow it all the way through from the t-shirt prep to the dye prep to the batching to the washing process. So what I'm going to do is I'm starting with a 100% cotton t-shirt. And that's going to give you the best results when you're using fiber reactive Procyon dies, which is that's what I'm using here. Um, I haven't used any of the kits, so I'm not real familiar with those. But I know some of those kits do have the the fiber reactive dies. And one of the things with the fiber reactive dies you need is soda ash. So I have a video on this here. I'm going to splice it in here soon. But the reason for using soda ash is it raises the pH level of the t-shirt and then that causes the dye to bond with it. So you need these three things um, to do a decent tie-dye tea. You need the, the cotton, you need the soda ash to raise the, the pH, and then the dye to color it. So we're going to discuss all of those things. So to start with, once you get your t-shirt, it's recommended that you do a pre-wash on it. Uh, anytime you buy them from the stores, there's possibility that they have some sort of a treatment on them, a stain resist. Well, that stain resist will also resist the dyes. So it's a good idea to do a pre-wash on them. And then you soak it in soda ash and make sure that it's thoroughly coated. Uh, if it's not completely coated, then it will show up as dark patches. So let me set up and show you what I mean by that. Okay. So this here is a t-shirt. What I've done here is just set up pointing this here towards the window so that you can have the light behind the t-shirt. So I just hold the t-shirt up and I look to see if it's an even color. And this one here you can look at that and see it's a fairly even color here which means that that has been fully saturated with the soda ash. This tea here I intentionally wadded it up and stuck it down in the bucket and these darker areas here, so these patches here that are making this weird little pattern on there, those are dry spots on the tee. So you just flip this around and you can see that on both sides there. That t-shirt has not been soaked in soda ash well enough. So these darker spots here, they don't have any soda ash on them, so they're not going to take dye most likely or the dye is going to be more faded in those areas. So then the way that I like to get most of the soda ash out of my t-shirt is by putting it into the wash machine and putting it just on the spin cycle. And then I turn it on and that will spin the excess out. So I'll usually go ahead by hand. I can squeeze out most of the excess because I don't want to waste the soda ash because the soda ash can be reused. So I just put it back into a bottle with the lid on it and then you can just keep on using that and when it gets low you just make more and that will be shown in the soda ash portion here coming up soon um, as well as the spin out process so you can see just how you get it because I'd like to have the t-shirt just barely damp when I'm folding it that makes it easier for your folding because when you start folding things up uh, the being damp just helps it stay together because sometimes you have to kind of let go of one part to fold another part and when it's dry it doesn't want to stay together so I like to fold them damp and then also when I put my dies on most of the time depending on what design but on the simpler designs I'll do all of that with the t-shirt just barely damp uh, if you have too much liquid in during the dyeing process then you'll have problems with saturation because that excess soda ash inside the t-shirt is going to inhibit the dye from coming in. Uh, so a t-shirt can only hold so much liquid and if part of that liquid is the soda ash then it's not going to be able to hold the dye. So I hope that makes sense for you.
So anyway, soda ash is just a white powdery substance. Uh, you can buy it directly from Dharma or whatever dye house that you buy from. But you can also buy it from a pool supply store. So I have some from both places. And what I'm going to do is show various ways of how I mix it um, and then the other thing some people have asked about baking soda baking soda is not soda ash uh, the technical term for this the baking their soda ash is sodium carbonate baking soda is sodium bicarbonate so it's close but it's not the same but you can heat this in the oven and turn it into soda ash so what I'm going to do is do kind of a test on the other two soda ashes and on the baked soda ash here. So what I have, I measured out two cups and I got myself a baking pan and I'm just following the directions of what I read on um, the Paula Birch site. And it said just to spread this out in a baking sheet here and then bake it in the oven at 400 degrees for one hour. So I'm going to go ahead and get this baking and then I'm going to get back and show you how I mix these other ones and then talk a little bit more about it. So I'll be right back. Okay, so that's in the oven now. So what I'm going to do is kind of talk a little bit about it. So soda ash is what we use to activate the fiber reactive procyon dyes. And you can buy those at various places here. So this is from Dharma. This is Procyon dye. This is from Custom Colors, Procyon dye. And this is from Grateful dyes. They're all Procyon dyes, so you can buy this from many places. But the soda ash actually activates the dyes. Um, there's also the one-step kits that you can buy in the stores. Uh, I don't know the ins and outs of all of them, but typically if it's a one step, uh, most likely that means that the soda ash has been mixed in with the dye. So you have your dye powder and your soda ash mixed together. So when you pour it into one of your bottles and pour water in there, then your soda ash is already mixed in. But what that also means, the, as soon as the soda ash and the dye come in contact with water, then the dye is active. So it's going to need to be used quickly. So if you're using one of the one-step kits, uh, I would recommend not mixing your dyes until you're ready to actually put them on your t-shirts. But if you want better colors, I would still recommend that you get some soda ash and do a pre-soak because personally I haven't used the kits, but I've heard from other people and they get the results that are the t-shirts which look faded so you want to use soda ash if you're using any kind of procyon dyes so with that being said there's a couple ways that I mix them up so if I'm going to do uh, use a blender what I would do is just pour my water in, and I use hot water uh, the soda ash tends to blend up faster, dissolve faster in hot water. So I just got a gallon of hot water here. And then what I'm going to do is pour in the soda ash and start blending it immediately. So I have one of these hand blenders here. And don't worry, I'll show you another method in case you don't have a hand blender. But you want to start act, uh, start blending as soon as the soda ash hits the water because if the soda ash goes in and sits for very long, it will just kind of turn into a big solid chunk. And I haven't had any luck breaking those up. I think you'd have to use a hammer or something to chip those back down into powder again. So anyways, we're going to blend this up right now. <laughs> Okay, so there is my soda ash from the pool supply store. We're going to set that aside. Now another way that you can do it is use it one of these bottles. What I'm going to do, I have a gallon of water here, but I'm going to pour half of it out into my tub here. 
just to give me room to shake the, the jug here. So once again, you want to be fast acting with this. So you want to make sure that there's no chunks or whatever in your thing that's going to clog your funnel here so that you can quickly pour it in, put the cap on, and then start shaking it. Because once again, if you leave it set for too long, which I have, I've poured it in and walked off and talked on the phone and came back and there was just a big solid chunk down in the bottom here. So I tend to pour this in quickly. I just shake my funnel to get it to go in. And this is one cup to one gallon. Ultimately, you want to have your soda ash, the pH, at a number between 10.6 and 11. So it usually dissolves up pretty quickly. I can hold it up to the light here and see that there's no chunks floating around in there. There's just a little bit of powder with that. That's fine. So once I get that all shook up, then I can pour it in here with the rest of this water. So this is one cup of the powder to one gallon of water. And we're going to use that after a bit here too. So now the only thing that we're waiting on is the other soda ash that still has to bake for a while. But I'll come back to that. And then what I'm going to do is do a test on all three of the soda ashes here. I have my little pH strips here. So we're going to test to see what what we have here with the, the pH. So I'll be right back. Okay, and to a, another name, uh, another place you can get the sodium carbonate at. Uh, like I say, if you go into the pool supply store, uh, the, you can either tell them soda ash or sodium carbonate. Uh, the main thing you want to make sure is you don't get the sodium bicarbonate or you'll have to bake it like what we're doing here. It's much easier if you can just get sodium carbonate to get that. Um, you can also get washing soda, which I haven't used that either, but that's in the laundry department and that's typically just the soda ash and you can look on the label usually and see the word soda ash or sodium carbonate um, but all of them you should be able to mix them about one cup to one gallon uh, I have my test strips here and they this here I don't know these test strips are old so they might not be accurate but I have I tested both of these and they're measuring right about 13 uh, so what we're going to do is soak a t-shirt in each one of these. So when I'm doing the, the soda ash soak, I'll soak these in here for 20 minutes and I make sure that I kind of slosh it around and get all the air bubbles out so that you get it completely coated there. So I'm going to soak these. So, so while we're baking our baking soda, we'll be soaking our t-shirts here. and. Then we'll get in and I'm going to do some tie-dye videos. It's time to do Halloween designs. So in other videos coming up soon, I'll be doing some of those with these t-shirts. So. Okay, so it's been 20 minutes of the t-shirt soaking in the soda ash. So what I do next is just, I start out by wringing it out by hand. And I'm doing mostly squeezing. I don't want to do too much twisting because if you twist too much across one of these seams you could stretch that and break some of those threads in there so I try to just mostly squeeze with my hands and then what I'm going to do is spin these out in the washer so the other thing that you can do is hang them to dry the one thing you don't want to do is put a soda ash soaked tea in the dryer I haven't happened had it happen to me but Back in the day, I guess a dyer had done that so often that a lot of the, the dry soda ash dust had built up in the, the dryer and then that caught fire. So don't put soda ash soaked teas in the dryer. You either need to... This here for me is, is too wet. Now I could spend more time squeezing and getting more of that out, but I don't want to wreck my hands. 
Um, so you can hang these up until they're just barely damp. Or like I say, you can spin them out in the wash machine and I'll show you how I do that. Okay, so here we are at the wash machine. So what I do is I just take my t-shirts that I've wrung out by hand just to get most of the soda ash out of them because I don't want to waste a bunch of soda ash uh, with it going down the drain with the spin out process. Uh, the other thing you can do if you want is disconnect your hose back here and have it go right into a bucket. Then when you spin it out, you're saving all your soda ash. But I'm not going to mess with that right now. The other thing you want to make sure of before you start doing your spin out is that your washer does not spray water during the spin out cycle. Some of them do right at the beginning of the cycle. Uh, an easy way to test that is to toss a couple dry t-shirts in to your washer, put it on the spin cycle and turn it on. Uh, most of the time you should be able to hear it, but sometimes it's just a little bit of water which is enough to dilute the soda ash. So spin it for a little bit, turn it off, open it up. If your t-shirts are wet, then it's spinning, spitting water. The other thing you can do is go back here to your spin cycle and maybe set it towards the end of the cycle instead of at the beginning of the cycle. So I know mine doesn't spit water, so I'll put it at the beginning of the cycle here. And then I just close the washer and turn that on. Okay, after about a minute, then they're just barely damp. And that's, that's my preferred method for folding these, is just to have them barely damp. So we'll pull these back out and we'll go do some videos here. Okay, so I finished up baking my baking soda to turn it into soda ash. And then I used just one cup. Remember, I mixed up, baked up two cups. And that was because I wasn't sure if the same amount of soda ash, homemade soda ash, was going to be the same. So anyways, I started with one cup, mixed it into one gallon, and then I did my test strip, and it tested the same as the other. Well, let's, let's just do it here. So, the way these test strips work is it's going to turn a color here, depending on what the thing is and for the optimum it should be somewhere between 10 and 11 down here my stuff has been testing around 13 now that might be due to the fact that this is older test strips I've had it for several years so when I hold this color up here maybe that's yeah it goes at about 12 here so I'm just going to assume that my test strips are just a little bit off but the fact that all three, the soda ash from Dharma, the soda ash from the pool supply, and my homemade soda ash, all three of them test the same here right around 12. I'm going to assume that my strips are a little bit off, but that they are, all of my soda ashes are going to be the same. So anyways, I'm going to put this in with the rest of my soda ash. And same thing with this excess powder here. I'll just mix that in with my other soda ash powder and we'll call it good. So anyways, that's that's what you use soda ash for. Um, you, you're using it for your Procyon dyes and you mix one cup to one gallon. I pre-soak my t-shirts for 20 minutes in them and then I wring them out by hand and then I spin them out in the washer until they're barely damp. So whenever I start a video and I say that my t-shirt's been soaked and spun out and barely damp, that's because I've gone through this whole process with the soda ash. And then the soda ash also, you can keep this. This doesn't go bad. So you can just put it back in a, a jug, put a lid on it. Or if you have a five gallon bucket with the lid, you can just put that on there. And I never pour my soda ash out. I just continue to add and make more. So when my five gallon bucket starts to get low then I'll just make up another gallon or two of soda ash poured in and I just keep using it sometimes it'll be discolored just a little bit and that's not bad um, if you're doing some over dyes where you're re-soaking a, a dyed t-shirt I won't drop it into my whole five gallon bucket I'll put maybe like a half gallon in a little pail and soak my t-shirt in there because some of that dye will kind of leach out 
and discolor your soda ash. And I don't know if that will go back into the t-shirts or not, but just to stay on the safe side, I don't re-soak an already dyed t-shirt in my brand new soda ash. I do that in a separate bucket so I can just pour the excess out. Okay, so once you have your t-shirt completely soaked in the soda ash, then the next thing you're going to do is wring it out and you can either wring it out by hand just by squeezing it. You don't want to do too much twisting on the t-shirt. You can do just a little bit of a twist, but if you do too much of a twist, you might rip some of the the threads in here. They they can break in the seams here and then those seams will come apart. Um, the other thing that I do when I'm doing tie-dye is I turn my t-shirts inside out. And there's a couple reasons for that. Sometimes I'm using a pencil or a washable marker to draw a design on. Now the washable markers almost always wash out. But the artist pencils, and I don't have one here, they don't always wash all the way out of the t-shirt. So if I'm going to have a stray mark that's left on the t-shirt, I'd rather it be on the inside. The other th thing is sometimes on some of the colors, like the, the reds, the browns, sometimes even the purples, the dye will not dissolve all the way. There will be just the really minuscule bits of powder left floating in the water that don't dye up, and they'll pass through the filter. I always pour mine through a really fine mesh filter, but that doesn't always stop all of the little fine bits. Well, when you put that onto the t-shirt, then sometimes those little tiny bits will stay on the t-shirt and then they'll dye extra dark making tiny little spots. Most of the time, those tiny little spots are just on whatever side that you have it on. So if you're dyeing on the inside, then those tiny little spots will be on the inside of the t-shirt instead of the outside. So those are the main reasons for turning the t-shirt inside out. The other thing then is when I'm centering the T, I can grab the, the armpits here. I can see the, the seams easily because I will like to flatten this out, make sure it's nice and straight when I'm doing my folding. Uh, if I'm going to fold a t-shirt in half, then I'll tuck one side in the other. And for that, the reason that I do that is if you fold a t-shirt just straight in half, then the two halves of the front of the t-shirt have two layers of fabric in between them. It would be the back of the t-shirt. So when you're putting your dies on, they're not always going to be nice and symmetrical because of that. So if I'm folding a t-shirt in half, I always like to fold it in half by tucking one sleeve into the other sleeve. And once I have the two sleeves in there together, I'll take these, these, this bottom hem here on both of the sleeves, line that up, and then I just line up the rest of the hem all the way around on the t-shirt here, or the armhole, and then you can just kind of give that a shake. And that will usually line things up pretty nicely. Then I'll reach in between the t-shirt, the front and the back here, and I'm just reaching and lining up this shoulder seam on top of itself. So then you can grab this neckline here and just make sure that that shoulder seam is lined up front and back. And then you can give it another shake. And then when I lay it down, I can usually go ahead and pick up the center of the front and the bottom, shake it one more time and lay it down. And then I can pick up the whole t-shirt front and back, pinched in there and lay it out and then that t-shirt is all nice and folded in half. And then that way when I'm doing any of my dyeing here, any of my folding, when I put my dyes on, the two parts of the front are right next to each other and the two parts of the back are right next to each other so then the dye is going to be more even. It might not be exactly the same front to back but it's at least going to be the same side to side which is what you're going to see. You're going to see the front or you're going to see the back of the T. Okay, so let's get on to folding this thing. So since I already have it folded in half here, the design I'm going to demonstrate in this video is what I call a spider. And I do have a few other videos on that, but we're going to do another one just because. So for a spider, what I'm going to do, I have it folded in half with the front and the back separate. 
So that's going to allow better side to side uh, symmetri sym <laughs> symmetry. Um, so the way I like to tie a spider is I go across from the armpit out and that puts the design, main part of the design right on the center of your chest and I'm going to pinch it right there and then I twist going down the t-shirt and that's going to put the spider on in the direction that I want. If you twist going up the t-shirt the other direction then that's just going to turn the, the design upside down or right side up if that's the way that you prefer to do it. So you can try it both ways and see which way that you like it. But I'm going to twist this one up and then like I say we're going to follow this t-shirt all the way through the whole process. So I like to just kind of smooth things out, flatten this out, and I try to work with my creases. Getting these creases to lay nice and flat instead of having ones that lay over top of each other. If they lay over top of each other then you're not going to get good dye saturation there. So I like to make sure that my creases line up next to each other here. So I'll kind of take the extra amount of time to just work those creases in, create them as these long folds and then lay them right down along side to side here because when we do the spider design the actual spider part of the design is the top parts of all these creases that's where we get the the shape from in our t-shirt so it pays to spend the extra time making sure that your creases are nice and even so what I'll do is pull the edges out here and create the creases and sometimes you can reach in there and pinch just to make extra ones but then slowly incorporate them into your design here and I just keep working switching back and forth between my hands here oh and it's also recommended you wear gloves um, I usually don't do it for the soda ash portion but some people can develop allergies to the soda ash. It does dry your hands out. I make sure I wash mine really well. I haven't had any issues with the soda ash but it is something that you want to be aware of if you're going to do a lot of tie dyeing. But we will put gloves on for the dyeing portion so we don't color our hands. So once I get this tied up just how I want it then you have a couple options. You can either use rubber bands or what my preference is is to use kite string. So that's what I'm going to use. I buy kite string. I get it from Ace Hardware. Or I guess it's called Kite Twine. So that's what it looks like. And I buy it at Ace Hardware. And it works really nice. If I can't get that, then the other thing I bought, let's see if I can find it. Um, is embroidery string, or actually crochet, crochet thread. So that you can probably find at any type of craft store, Michael's or Joann's or something. It's not as strong as the kite string, but it does work if you can't find the kite string. And it's not too bulky. Some of the strings out there are more bulky than what I want. And I do have a video on how I use the kite string. I'll put a link to that down in the description box. But basically I want to tie this up nice and tight just to hold everything together. Okay, so there's my spider design and I have a cuticle pusher. I bought this just in the nail department at uh, any department store used for pushing cuticles or whatever but it has a nice smooth edge on it so I like to use it if I need to adjust any of my folds a little bit I can get in there and kind of push things down in there I check to see if I have any of my creases any of my 
folds that are laying over top of one another. So I can kind of push in there and just adjust things and not worry about tearing a hole in it because that's that's the one thing sometimes if you use something that has too sharp of an edge and you push down in there, you can tear a little hole without realizing it. So a cuticle pusher is a good tool or just anything with a nice smooth edge on it. And then it comes down to picking your, your dies out and coloring it. So for the, the spider, there's several ways of coloring it. You can just use two colors, put one color on one side, flip it over, put another color on the other side, and that'll give you a nice spider design that's kind of similar to the one that I'm wearing. This one here is green and purple, and I think I even added a little bit of black over top of it. And, well, it already had this dove image on it. But you can see the spider design there. The other way that you can do it is by putting pie shapes on there. So I'll do three lines on here creating six pieces of pie and I cross them all right here in the center. And then what I'm going to do is dye these in the rainbow color on one side and then I'm going to put a solid color on the other side of the t-shirt. And the solid color then will be the spider design and these here are going to create, um, I guess the closest thing I can think to is like a, a peacock feather type shape on the t-shirt. And of course you'll see that at the end of the video here. So I'm going to use rainbow colors for this. So let me get some gloves on, I'll be right back. Okay, so we're back to put some color on this. So what I'm going to do now is color inside these little triangles here. And I'm just going to color each one of the triangles a different color. And I'm going to go in the rainbow pattern here, or the color wheel pattern. So I'm just making sure that I saturate everything here. And just because you have color on the top doesn't mean that it's soaked all the way down inside. So if you take a peek down in here, you can see that that white is resting just below the surface. So that's one of the things that you're going to have to practice is getting just the right amount of dye on there and that's going to come from experience of just putting on and checking your results at the end but you can improve that by checking ultimately you want the dye to soak about halfway into the t-shirt because the other side you're going to get the other half so just by applying your dye and just getting a feel for it and the more that you do the better you're going to have a feel for how much dye needs to go on the t-shirt. So, and one of the tips when I'm doing the rainbow design, I will typically put just the primary colors. So that being the red or the fuchsia, the yellow and the blue or the turquoise. Those three colors I'll color all the way up to the point of the triangle. And then the other colors, I'll just color up to the white spot. And what that's going to do is help cut down on having too much dye there in the center because that middle part is only you know that big around. And if you've got six colors in that spot, it's possible that you're going to have brown form in the middle there where all six colors ran together. So just to try to keep minimize how much color mixing you have, if you put just your primaries, which are going to mix nice and evenly up there in the middle, that just saves you from having too much color mixing go on. I don't know if that made sense. Sorry. I'm just rambling sometimes. So here's my blue. This is a cerulean blue I'm using. Normally I use turquoise, but I like to mix up the rainbow. So you can use any shade you want for each one of the colors. The main thing is just putting them on in the correct order. And so just following the color wheel basically is what we're doing here. So between the yellow and the blue you're going to put green. So you can pick whatever shade of green you want to go in that space. And then like I say I'm only going up to just where the white is instead of all the way up to the exact center with this green. And the yellow and the blue already mixed there in the middle, so there will be a little bit of a different color green there in the middle. So then my purple, I'm going to put that on between the blue and the red colors here. 
And once again, you can put a light shade of purple or a dark shade. This one here is called Plum, and it's a Dharma dye. So and this one here is Fuchsia, which is a primary, and this is Lemon Yellow, which is another primary color. So and I just kind of watch and see how the dye soaks in. I kind of can get a feel for how much dye needs to go on there, just because I've been doing it for so long. But you'll want to open those cracks up and check that, just so that you can get your dye saturation down. And then this last color here is called Deep Orange, and that one is also a Dharma color. All of these are from Dharma except for the Cerulean Blue. That one is from Grateful Dyes. And the other company that I'll buy from is Custom Colors. So those are the three dye houses, Dharma, Grateful Dyes and Custom Colors, the three places that I bought from, but I'm sure there's many more places that you can buy these fiber reactive Procyon dyes. I know Jacquard makes uh, the dyes. Those ones you might even be able to find in craft stores. So the Procyon dyes are the ones that I've used for the whole time I've been doing tie-dye, and they provide me some excellent colors. So that's what I've just stuck with this whole time. Okay, so now I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to dye the other side all one color. So I'm going to use a blue violet. This one here is also from Dharma. So it should be kind of a brighter, lighter color of purple. So that will give me, well, it looks a little bit dark, but we'll see. It's at least a different shade than the plum here. I like to try out new colors and see if I can find new favorites. So I just keep exploring. So this here color, I'm going to just apply it one coat the whole thing instead of dyeing in the triangles. So this basically, I'm dyeing uh, these, all of these creases here and this here is what's going to give me my actual spider shape is this one color on here. And like I say, you can do just two colors, one on each side, and get these same type of results. Only you'll have just the, the spider shape instead of the uh, peacock looking shape on there, the peacock feather. So next to the orange here, I'm just kind of leaving a little bit of white space, let that dye spread on its own some so that I don't create brown right there. And then the same thing with the yellow. So I'll go back and touch those up a little bit with my other colors. So whenever I'm putting colors on that don't blend well, and if you get yourself a color wheel, you can look at those. Any ones that are on one side of the color wheel, those, if they're touching another color, that means they're going to blend well uh, by putting them all, uh, together. But some of these other colors, like orange and purple, they don't blend well. They'll make more of a brown color. So if you put your darker color on first and let it spread a little bit, then you can kind of touch up with the orange and not create as much brown. So leaving a little bit of white space is helpful in those cases. And then that way you can go back and touch that up just a little bit as needed and where needed. But the dye will spread on its own over time, so most of the time I'll put the dark color on first and let it get it all of its spreading done. Okay, so now that I have this dyed all the way, I can take a quick peek and make sure that it looks like I have enough color in there. And when I look down inside, I see just a little bit of white, but not a lot. So I know that the, the dye is going to spread a little bit more on its own. I'm going to add just a tiny bit more on here, but then from there the dye should spread. You don't need to get it to the point of no white or you might have a lot of extra color mixing that you don't want. So once I get to this point, now it's ready to batch. And what batching is, is letting the dye actually react with the cotton fibers. And that's what the soda ash does. It activates the dyes so that they can start bonding. And they need time to do that, and they need a little bit of heat. Not a lot of heat, 
just 70 degrees is good enough. If it's less than that, then you might have a problem with your dyes bonding enough. If you have more than that, then that's going to help encourage it even more. But a 70 degree Fahrenheit is the minimum where I like to batch my, my dyes at. And I'll leave mine set for a minimum of 24 hours to give the dyes time to react, but I prefer to leave mine for 48 hours. And that does a couple things. It gives the dyes more time to bond with the cotton fibers. And it also, the dyes will be pretty much spent, meaning they are no longer active after 48 or longer period of time. So when you're doing your washout, then you have less of a problem with back staining. Sometimes you put all your stuff in the washer and wash it, and then the whites come out looking gray. Well, that's because you have back staining going on from some of the active dye in your, shirt, your shirts. So letting them sit for longer is going to cut down on that. And I'm going to move this right now, but I'll show you in just a second how I do my batching here. So I'll be right back. Okay, so this is my preferred method for batching. So I have these plastic tubs. These are ones that fit, I believe they're meant for storage, like under the bed space or whatever. They're about what, six or seven inches tall. And then I went to the uh, closet department in Home Depot and I found these big long racks for your closet. And then I just cut them to length with a Dremel tool and they fit right in here. They do have a, a lip on one side and no lip on the other side. So I cut some PVC, the three quarter inch PVC pipe and I set those down in there and that just equalizes my rack so that it sits level. Um, so what this does, setting them on the rack allows any excess dyes. If you put too much dye on, the excess dyes can drip through into the bottom of the container here. If you put them in a plastic bag or you batch them like just on a flat table like this here, if there's any excess dyes then they might puddle underneath and then it will give you uh, black lines if all of the colors have mixed together into one color. Then you'll have black lines show up. If you're doing a spider with a dark color on the bottom like this here, it's not going to matter as much. But if you're doing a rainbow like this here and you don't want the dark colors, then you don't want the dye puddling up underneath. The other thing when I'm doing ones like this here with the rainbow on one side and a dark color, I always batch with the dark color going on the bottom side. So any of that excess dye is going to go down rather than into my rainbow colors here. And I'll put a lid on this, which that is going to then keep this moist because the t-shirt needs to stay wet for the dyes to batch. If the t-shirt dries out, then the dyes are no longer active. So you can leave it sit for a week, but if it's dry, it's not going to do anything else for you. So you want to keep it wet for the whole time while it's batching. So that's why I put a lid on these. And then in the summertime, I can pick these up. I can have two or three t-shirts depending on how they're folded. I can easily move them outside. I'll set them out on the roof in the sun and that helps increase the heat in here. In the winter time I can stack these because they're stackable and I'll have them stacked you know five or six high right next to a heater vent and the heater vent then will help provide the extra heat that I need for the batching temperature. And then after that, we'll do the washout, and I'll be back and show you that when it's time. So, 48 hours. Okay, I'm back now. Uh, Mr. Tie-Dye here. So, I'm going to be doing my washout. So, these have been batching for 48 hours. So, one of the things I like to see is this little bit of condensation built up here in the lid. I don't know if that's seen in the video, but... To me, that means that I've got some nice heat on my tie dyes here. So they've been batching for 48 hours. 24 hours is a minimum that I'll go, but I prefer 48 hours because it just allows more time for the dyes to set up. Also, the dyes are pretty much spent by the time I get around to washing them. So the back staining that happens in the washer sometimes is much less 
with this. And these here are still damp in here, so the lid has done its job of keeping them moist, but also has allowed the heat to build up in the container, which is evident by the moisture and stuff on the... So anyways, what we're going to do first is drop one of these in the sink and get it rinsing. So let me get set up here. Okay, so to start out with when I'm doing my washout process, the first thing I do is put these in the sink and just run cold water over top of them. The cold water is going to rinse away any of the soda ash that's left here in the tea, which of course there's going to be a lot of it. Um, <clears throat> but the soda ash is what activates the dyes. So before I open this up and start releasing more of the, the excess dyes in this t-shirt, I want to make sure that all of the soda ash is gone because I don't want that dye being reactivated and then bonding. That's where the, the back staining happens in the washing machine is just the dyes that are still semi there, which like I say, after 48 hours, there's not many of them, but it's still a possibility. <clears throat> So if I rinse away all that soda ash, and then in the washing machine, I'm going to use a pH neutral soap called Synthropol. Uh, I buy it from Dharma. I know a lot of other dyers, they use what, uh, they use Blue Dawn dish soap, which is another pH neutral soap. Uh, a lot of detergents that you buy in the store, they will have soda ash in them because soda ash is a washing agent. So that's why you don't want to wash your tie-dyes when you're doing your initial rinse and wash on them. You don't want to use regular detergents. Uh, Synthopol or Blue Dawn or even just no detergent at all. If you don't have it and can't get it, it's better to use nothing than to use a, a detergent that has soda ash in it because that's just going to encourage the back staining in the washing machine. So anyways, I'll do a, a, about a minute long rinse on these t-shirts just to rinse away the soda ash. Once that's done, then I feel like I can kind of stack them up a little bit and let the water run down over the whole pile here. So that way I'm utilizing my water fully. So when that happens, then I can throw another one in this other sink here and do the rinse out on it. <clears throat> Get the soda ash gone. And then I can put it on the bottom of the pile also. So now I'm just going to rinse these one by one. I'm going to turn the water up to about warm here. And I'll continue to do my washout. The warm water is going to encourage more of the excess dyes to come out. So that's why you're seeing the, the darker water here. That's because the warm to hot water will help release the excess dyes that are not bound to the cotton fibers. <clears throat> So I'm going to let this run for just a little bit here, and then I'm going to pull these bands off. But while I'm doing this, I'm going to go back and start my wash machine. And I usually will fill it up about halfway with hot water, and I add just a little bit of Synthropol, just enough to make some suds. And that way, when I'm done rinsing these, they can go right into the, soda at, the Synthropol hot water bath there in the washer. So I'll be back in a second. Okay, so here I am filling the washer up, and I'm going to just do a quick squirt. Well, actually, with the first wash, I'll do a longer squirt of the Synthopol, just because there's going to be more of the inactive dye. So really what I like to see is just to have some suds form on top of the water when the water the water is going in. So that's here. That's looking pretty good right there. So I'm going to finish filling this up and I'm going to go out and start rinsing. Okay, so here's the spider that we tied up. So we'll get the strings cut off of there and then open this up so you can see the colors. So this is the one I did the rainbow on one side and the purple color on the other side. So you can see my spider design show up there with the rainbow colors through it. And now we'll open this up. Remember I have one sleeve tucked inside the other, which that helps the side-to-side -side symmetry 
of the design here. So there's my spider design, rainbow spider. So that's the same front and back. I mean, it's a little bit different. There was more of the purple on the back side, but that's because the back side is where I applied the purple and the front side is where I applied the rainbow colors. But the side to side is what we're going for to make sure that that's fairly even. The only place that I see just a little bit of difference is in this leg here and this leg here. Those, and I just gets a little bit right there. But the side to side is pretty good on this one here, so. We're going to toss that in and then I'll complete this video, have the results of everything at the very end. Thank you for watching. Okay, here we are. I got, I didn't get back here in time to, to show you the water after the first wash. The first wash, it's really dark. This one here, I can still see some color in there. Um, the first wash, wash, I will go ahead and let it run all the way through the wash cycle and then through the rinse cycle. But for the next two, I usually will stop it after the wash cycle and fast forward it, spin it out, and if anything, I might spray a little bit of water in there to do a rinse, but then I fill it right back up with hot water again. And so on the third one, I'll come back here and check this water, and it usually will be fairly well clear. And if not, then I'll go ahead and run it through one more hot wash cycle. And I have just a little bit of suds. That's kind of like how I like it. I don't need, you know, a big bubble bath. But as long as there's just a little bit of suds, that tells me that I have a little bit of soda ash in there. Or not soda ash, excuse me. I have a little bit of synthropol in the water. And I know that I'm not going to have any back staining. So we're going to go ahead and let this sit. And if I manage to stop the washer before it goes into the spin for the last cycle, I'll show you how clear the water is. And then, of course, I'll have all the results at the end of this video. Thank you.